No one has done more than Sheila Lodge to keep Santa Barbara a special place, an uncommonplace town. She became a member of the Planning Commission when she was in her early 40s, appointed by a new environmentally conscious city council. She and the Planning Commission recommended downzoning to limit the population growth to a goal of 85,000 people. The recommendation went up to the city council. She wanted to be where the decision would be made. And so she ran for a seat on the city council and was elected to the first of two terms. The population goal of 85,000 people was adopted by a four to three vote, her vote. She was encouraged to run for mayor. She ran and won and became Santa Barbara's first woman mayor. She served for three terms, the longest serving mayor in Santa Barbara history. And later in retirement, she became unhappy with what they were doing to what she calls my town. So at age 80, she got herself reappointed to the Planning Commission. And this year, she's completing her fourth term. She has led an uncommon and enduring political life. In 2020, she published a book about Santa Barbara, an uncommonplace American town. It is a masterful tutorial about Santa Barbara history and planning in just 101 pages. It tells how from the earliest days of Spanish settlers, Santa Barbara area faced a water shortage. And so Mission Dam was one of the first things built after the settlers arrived. In the 1880s, Stern's Wharf opened the city to the world and brought growth and lumber from the north. And so Victorian homes began to be built in Santa Barbara, much like those in the rest of the country. That meant we needed a new proper American courthouse. That was columns and a pediment up above and a dome above that and the city continued to grow. And then in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the mission style became popular. A new train station was built, the Potter Hotel and many other buildings during that period. And the City Beautiful movement came along to help people realize that cities and towns needed parks, they needed light, they needed air, they needed planning. Then in 1915, the Panama California Exposition in San Diego introduced the Spanish revival style to Southern California. It became the style in San Diego, in Pasadena, in Beverly Hills, and no place more than in Santa Barbara. Major new buildings began to be built in the Spanish style. There's the County Bank Building on the left on State Street. But how to update the existing buildings that had already built in a more traditional American style? After all, Santa Barbara had become much like a Wild West town, like any other, with wooden storefronts and tin roofs. There's the clock tower to the right of the county bank building. How to update those buildings that had already been built? It took divine intervention. And in 1925, a major earthquake hit the city. The new wood and brick buildings didn't fare so well. The courthouse was damaged beyond repair. But the earthquake was not as disastrous as it's sometime portrayed. Only 18% of the buildings downtown were destroyed, mostly the new wood and brick buildings. The new Spanish style buildings fared remarkably well and State Street was quickly repaired in a Spanish style. You see the clock building there has been replaced by more Spanish style buildings. And a new courthouse became the centerpiece of Spanish Santa Barbara. The result was a harmonious and beautiful city built in its own unique style. And planning was the key.
The Planning Commission was created in 1923, even before the earthquake. The Architectural Board of Review was created 11 days after the earthquake, the first in the country. And it was all due to one thoughtful and foresighted person, Pearl Chase, often seen as the patron saint of Santa Barbara, or so we're often told. Sheila begs to differ in her book. She says that Pearl Chase gets much more credit than she deserves, especially since the idea for Spanish Santa Barbara came from Bernard and Irene Hoffman. The Hoffmans moved here in 1919, seeking treatment for diabetes from their daughter, from Dr. Sansom, like a lot of other people who came to Santa Barbara during that time. They restored Casa de la Guerra. They built El Paseo, Meridian Studios, and numerous other buildings. He was secretary of the city's first planning commission. He served on the first architectural board of review. There he is ready for the first fiesta in 1924. And he had a hand in the building of a new city hall and a rebuilt libero theater and restored the Lugo Adobe behind Meridian Studios. He was the first chair of the Plans and Planting Committee, the all-important Plans and Planting Committee, which brought concern for architecture and for landscaping to Santa Barbara. That was the committee that drafted the first building code and the first zoning ordinance. And it was only later that Pearl Chase became the chair of the Plans and Planting Committee and succeeded him. They're remembered with a plaque in El Paseo. And he always said it was his wife's idea to create Spanish Santa Barbara. And it certainly was her money. As it happens, her father died in 1919, the year they came to Santa Barbara. He had consolidated the packing houses in Chicago and she was the sole heir to his fortune. If Santa Barbara had a Mount Rushmore, Pearl Chase and the Hoffmans would be on it. Sheila's book details many other issues that happened in Santa Barbara during its history, including the long fight to keep the waterfront and the beaches public. The Southern Pacific Railroad had a plan of its own they were gonna move Carrillo Boulevard back from the waterfront and build a hotel and restaurants and a conference center. Sheila helped Fess Parker build a low rise hotel that maintained the views of the mountains and earned his gratitude when he supported her opponent in the next election. <laughs> then there was El Mirasol, the plan to build two nine story condos presented as a done deal to the city until again, a group of engaged citizens stepped up and challenged it. And the result is that we have Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens instead. The lesson of her book is that it takes thoughtful planning to shape a beautiful city. And it takes engaged citizens who step up and play a role and seeing that the right thing happens. The Sheila Lodge story begins on June 13th, 1929. She spent her early years in Ojai on her family's dairy farm. Small dairies were big in Ojai in those days and really everywhere else before pasteurization came along. There she is at nine years old on take your pet to school day. Her father outfitted her with a pair of calves. Her parents were Mark and Sophie Markov, Russian Jewish immigrants from what we now know as Ukraine. Her mother was focused on the education of Sheila and her older brother. And she had heard that the Ojai Valley School was one of the best. And so they moved there before Sheila was a year old from their earlier dairy farm outside Los Angeles. She was smart. She taught herself to read before she started the school. She skipped the second and the seventh grades. 
The family was often over the mountains in Santa Barbara. They had relatives here. Sheila and her brother took piano lessons here. And her mother was in nursing school for a time at the St. Francis Hospital. In those days, all the nurses were women and all the doctors were men. The nurses were expected to stand when the doctors walked into the room. Sheila's mother refused to do it. She was invited to leave. And so she never became a registered nurse. She continued as a practical nurse instead. Later, they moved to the Bay Area and Sheila went to a dozen different schools before she graduated from high school the week she turned 16. She eagerly moved to Berkeley and got a room and a job intending to study architecture. But before classes started, her mother showed up and declared that she wouldn't go to Berkeley after all. She would go to Stanford so she could live at home. And then after a year at Stanford, her mother pulled her out and moved her to San Jose State. And there she is as a young ingenue playing in Moliere. She felt that her mother wanted to control her life, and Sheila was developing a strong will of her own. And so at 18, she got married and moved to Maryland. Her husband, Santa Barbara native Joe Nadler, was in college there. She taught school at first and later became a social worker. And when he graduated, they wanted to move back to Santa Barbara. They came home to California in 1950, and after two years in LA, they moved to Santa Barbara in 1952. There's a photo of an address she made herself about that time. She was a short order cook, fancy that, a short order cook at his family's bait, tackle, and hamburger stand at the foot of the Goleta Pier. She got involved in civic life, Here's her first photo in the local newspaper, Mrs. Joseph L. Nadler with the League of Women Voters. She fumed at being identified as Mrs. Joseph Nadler. They had two daughters, but the marriage didn't last. And during that time, she went about completing her degree at UCSB. And shortly after getting her degree, she married a young municipal judge, Joseph Lodge, in 1961. He often drew an opponent, so she got her first political experience running his political campaigns. They had two more daughters, and she had her own quartet. For many years, she was a stay-at-home mom, and then she gradually got more involved in politics. The kids were mostly supportive, but soon after she got elected to the city council and rushed home one night to make dinner before she came back for another meeting, her youngest daughter said to her father, if mother decides to run for anything again, you'd better not vote for her. She studied drafting and design at City College and designed their own home up on Mission Ridge a roof line shaped like the mountains beyond. She designed it, it says so on the plans, but it was a home for Judge and Mrs. Joseph Lodge. You enter through a garden of citrus trees and flowers, roses everywhere, but only scented roses. It's not a rose, she says, unless it smells like a rose. And it is quite a striking home with a magnificent living room on the right and views of the garden and the mountains beyond and on the other side, a view of the ocean. And half a century later, it would be designated a structure of merit by the city of Santa Barbara. In the early 70s, Santa Barbara politics began to change and she got more involved. The oil spill in 1969 brought a growing environmental consciousness to the area. In fact, the first Earth Day was held in 1970 
right here in Santa Barbara. The area was developing serious water, traffic, and air quality issues. There was smog in Santa Barbara and in the Goleta Valley. The city council majority changed in response to those growing sentiments from a business-oriented council that it had always been to a more environmentally conscious council. They commissioned a study on the effects of urban growth. It became a hot topic. How many people should there be here? And the new council appointed Sheila to the planning commission. The planning commission recommended that 85,000 population goal about half of what current zoning allowed. The down zoning recommendation went up to the city council and Sheila wanted to be where the final decision was made. So she ran for city council and the city council adopted the 85,000 population goal by that four to three vote, Sheila's vote. They also put it on the ballot, and it turned out to be a good thing to do, asking the voters to approve the 85,000 population limit, because the council majority seesawed back and forth again between being more business oriented to being more environmentally conscious. It was a fractious group, the best show in town, they said. The cartoonists suggest that Sheila played tic-tac-toe to keep her cool. In an interview that ran with this photograph, she credited gardening. I often take out my frustrations on the weed, she said. Rip, this is so-and-so. Rip, this is someone else. She gave a talk she titled, My First 10 Months on the City Council, or What's a Nice Girl Like Me Doing in a Place Like This? She also said, the problem with a woman politician is that she doesn't have a wife at home. But she was hooked and she ran for reelection and won again. Then in 1981, she was encouraged to run for mayor. She and Hal Conklin generally agreed on the issues and both of them wanted to be mayor. She found his holier than thou attitude a bit tough to take. It became a big issue among progressives. Would their split give the election to big development? And for several months, the fight played out, which of them would run? But Sheila was determined. She was running. And she was elected. Al Conklin returned to the council. Her business card made it official. She was Sheila Lodge, mayor of the city of Santa Barbara. One of the first major events she faced was the Queen's visit in 1983. Now the first woman mayor often got advice from her constituents. I like this letter from February of 1983. Dear Mayor Lodge, as concerned citizens of Santa Barbara, we thought it might help if we made a few suggestions to you. We think you have nice features and a very pleasant smile. However, perhaps if you had a shorter, softer hairdo, something around your face, it would enhance your features all the more. We also feel that since the queen is coming soon, perhaps you should start wearing clothing that is a little more up to date and pleasing to the eye. Since everyone is so concerned about sprucing up the city before the queen comes, we feel that our officials should try to look their best as representatives of our beautiful city. Signed, Concerned Natives of Santa Barbara. And there she was at the courthouse to welcome the queen. Her hair was pulled up as usual under a hat she made herself. The mayor and the judge, they were the toast of the town. She ran for re-election four years later and won again. She loved Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara loved her back. 
She faced many contentious issues during her three terms in the mayor's office. There was a perpetual water shortage, a long drought, limits on water usage. She probably didn't do herself any favors when she said in an interview that she only took a shower every three or four days and her husband didn't seem to mind. But she helped build a desalination plant and presided over its dedication. The rains returned just about that time and the desalination plant was mothballed, but it's been put back in use several times. And today the citizens of Montecito receive their water from the desal plant. The freeway was completed, eliminating the last traffic light on 101 between Mexico and San Francisco. She presided over the ceremony. She invested in downtown and tried to keep shopping on State Street by building Paseo Nuevo and through other moves. For a time, she even proposed removing cars from part of State Street and was nearly hung from a lamppost in La Arcada in response. She embraced her ceremonial role, riding in the fiesta parade, dressing up to open the horse show, even sharing her Thanksgiving plans in an article in the local newspaper. She was working more than full time and keeping her own house and tending her garden but she got another job just the same. She was pursuing a long held dream of being an architect. And so she got a job working part-time at a local architecture firm. She even got talked into running for supervisor of the county at the same time she was mayor. That was her only loss and the only campaign she didn't run herself. She ran for a third term to wide acclaim from Democrats and Republicans. She wanted to finish the downzoning proposal that had begun earlier. A part of it was to put a population cap on to limit the number of people who could live here. But another equally important part was to limit job growth. And that's what Proposition E would have done. If there weren't more jobs, there wouldn't be more people with a reason to move to Santa Barbara. And it passed. A David over Goliath victory, the news press called it. Actually, the headline says Mayor Lodge easily won a third term, but you might note her comments on the margin. Easily, it was lots of hard work. The slow growthers swept the election. Not everybody loved her, of course. This recall bumper sticker showed up on the front of City Hall one day. She got hate mail. Here's a note that came with this note on the side of her photo, the face of a radical. There were unending wrangles over the homeless in Santa Barbara. She was lampooned in a series of Doonesbury cartoons. And the Morton Bay fig tree, which was a favorite hangout of transients, became known as Sheila's Lodge. Of course, she wore a t-shirt, joined in the fun. And nobody liked the restrictions on water. She feared for a time that she might be remembered as a heartless and unwashed mayor. Term limits were adopted here as they were in many other places during that time, and she couldn't run again for a fourth term, although she remains convinced she would have won had she run. Her time at City Hall came to an end, although she says in this article on the front page of the news press, I love this city and I'm not going away. As she cleared out her office, the paper noted her subdued nature and endless reservoir of patience, but also her steely determination. She took a victory lap, taking credit for slow and managed growth. The news press offered its thanks and called her 
a class act. It was quite a record. One term on planning, two terms on the city council, three terms as mayor. Hal Conklin finally got his shot and was elected to succeed her, but only for a few months. He had helped write the term limits ordinance to limit the prospects of his opponents, but he was hoist on his own petard. It turned out it applied to him too. And after a few months, he had to step down as mayor and she was followed having broken the glass ceiling by a string of woman mayors. Only women served as mayor of Santa Barbara until the current mayor, Randy Rouse, was elected. Nobody expected her to retire, and she didn't. Soon she was the head of two local groups, including Planned Parenthood, this mother of four, although she noted there were only two children from two different marriages. She toyed with going back on the Planning Commission. She says in this article, I need to ease off my involvement rather than go cold turkey. Hal Conklin, who was mayor at the time, gleefully said, I can't wait to interview Sheila and see if she's qualified. But it was not to be. She didn't find the support she had hoped for, and she withdrew her application. She expected, nonetheless, to keep an eye on city council meetings, but she never watched another one. Instead, she devoted herself to her garden, and her roses celebrated her return. There's one day's cuttings. Can you imagine the perfume in her house? She took up painting and demonstrated considerable talent. She became a docent, first at the Botanic Garden, until she disagreed with the director's move to broaden the focus beyond native plants. And then at the Santa Barbara County Courthouse, she received her 20-year pen earlier this year. She remained a vital city voice, writing op-ed articles. You'll note there's another one in The Independent this week and pungent letters to the editor. Here's a favorite of mine from 2005 in response to an editorial criticizing the requirement for Spanish-style buildings. I'd like to point out that the requirement only applies to a rather limited area downtown along the waterfront, she wrote, and to an architect who complained that in the last 78 years, there had been only two buildings built of excellent design. Sheila writes, outside El Pueblo Viejo architects have been able to design in varying architectural styles. Pray tell me, where are the designs of excellence outside El Pueblo Viejo? Life was good, but she says, I didn't like what they were doing to my town. In 2008, Judge Joe Lodge died. He was by then the longest serving trial judge in the state. The general plan update offered an opportunity to get more involved, and she became chairman of the general plan update committee. She wrote the mission statement sounding her familiar themes, living within our natural resources, managing growth, and preserving views of the ocean and the mountains. And she not only wrote the brochure, but she also edited and designed it using her own photographs as illustrations. And she got herself reappointed to the Planning Commission 35 years after she'd started there. And this year, she completes her fourth term this time around. And on June 13th, at a planning commission, where else? To applause and a song, she celebrated her 95th birthday. If Santa Barbara did have a Mount Rushmore, Pearl Chase and the Hoffmans, of course, would be on it for creating Spanish Santa Barbara, and so would Sheila Lodge 
for doing more than anyone else to keep it that way. Ask her why she's kept at it all these years, and she'll tell you simply, I love this town, and I want to be sure it remains the special place it has always been. Thank you. It's, it's been a great journey. Uh, and I, I appreciate the opportunity that I've been given by the people of Santa Barbara to serve as mayor and planning commissioner. So, and I, I think I've made a positive difference. So thank you. Now we'll both entertain a few questions, but I want to start by asking you one, Sheila, because one of the things I don't talk about much is your role as a woman politician and all of the challenges and the hurdles you faced because of that. Because you always told me there weren't any. When I was newly elected to the city council, I got a call from someone who was arranging a conference for women mayors. Now, this was the time when, for, for women elect, as council members or as elected officials, and it was in the 70s, it was, it was a change. That was when Diane, Diane Feinstein was mayor of San Francisco, a woman named Janet Gray was mayor of San Jose. And uh, they asked me to come participate in this conference uh, to say what the challenges uh, as a woman I had. And I said, well, I'm the wrong person to ask because I haven't experienced that here. I don't know if it's Santa Barbara or if, well, I always treated people with respect and, ex and they treated me with respect in return. And when I was elected, mayor the first time, one of the reporters asked me, how does it feel to be Santa Barbara's first mayor, woman mayor? And I said, I don't think about it that way. I'm just glad to be Santa Barbara's next mayor. All right, and one more before we take questions from the audience. Why are you so hard on Pearl Chase? <laughs> well, it isn't fair. <laughs> because it really was Bernard and Irene Hoffman, who, Irene, Bernard Hoffman quoted Irene as coming up with the idea, uh, you know, that really should be restoring what we already had. There were very few of the Spanish era adobes left, but he, um, Bernard uh, worked with, the, the, there were a couple of Delaguerra descendants still living in Casa Delaguerra to restore Casa Delaguerra and then to build El Paseo around it. Um, and, and actually his father, he, he's from a small town in eastern, in western Ma uh, Massachusetts called Stockbridge. His father before him had worked there on creating a a sort of uniform architectural style for uh, their English colonial or East Coast colonial uh, for that community. So he had that example. And uh, and Pearl Chase herself said um, in, in a letter to him that uh, she referred to it as his project. The, the whole, when, when a booklet was published on Santa Barbara architecture, and a, and a style of, so Santa Barbara's own did come to being. Unfortunately, there are some architects who was my response to that letter saying how stifling the requirement for Spanish colonial was downtown. Uh, then don't get it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> what, what would you like to see happen with State Street? Well, as uh, Thomas mentioned briefly, I'd suggested at one point when I was mayor that having been to Santa Monica and seen their 
four blocks of uh, three blocks of pedestrian streets of their main, main shopping street closed to cars and then to boulder colorado i thought which has a wonderful uh, four block long pedestrian street and very successful um but we should try it in santa barbara and i suggested that for a couple of weekends only and for two blocks only <laughs> that as a test, we close Santa Barbara State Street to, to uh, cars. And the owner of La Cata, a man named Hugh Peterson, a lovely man and world's nicest landlord to his tenants, um, and he always supported me when I ran for office, he came totally unglued. He hired some outside consultants to come and say what Santa Barbara should should do. And uh, that was when I, I, and there was a presentation made, he had used the art museum's uh, theater for the presentation. And that, that was when I felt as if I nearly got hung and from a lag post in, uh, in Larkata. And what the consultant said is that the car should be what Santa Barbara should do. Oh, at that time, it, it was relative, well, no, it wasn't relatively new, but back in the 60s when La Cumbre Plaza went in, the businesses downtown realized that they were going to totally die if they didn't provide parking. Many of the businesses had a few spaces behind their particular building, but they got together and established one of the first parking districts and built the parking lots and the parking structures that are there now, which is the only thing that saved downtown. And so, uh, and then that's when they took the parking off of State Street, widened the sidewalks and created what is there today. Uh, and their suggestion was that we'd bring back the parking to State Street. Yes, <laughs> I see someone looking at me. What? <clears throat> uh, so it got dropped. Well, I could tell other tales about Mr. Peterson too about that, but anyway, I won't. And I could note that she not only traveled to all those other cities to check out their car-free zones, but photographed them and published a booklet laying out her findings. She not only remembers every detail and every name and every date from throughout her life, but she also deals in facts and looks at the studies and does her research. Sheila is a geologist as well. She has followed the San Andreas Fault by herself in the car from its inception down south and all the way following it and then recording it and having a wonderful slide presentation on her on her travels all through the San Andreas Fault. Oh, th thank you, Sue. It was uh, I, when I my mother declared that I was going to go to Stanford. They the first freshman year there was almost all required courses, and one of them was a one year course in the physical sciences. If you weren't going into the sciences, one of them was this physical sciences course, which is a quarter of physics, a quarter of uh, biology, and a quarter of geology. Well, I just got hooked on geology. California is, is, is so fascinating. And uh, yeah, I, I just, it, it, it was something that it was, and I recommend it to anybody. And I started over on the Carrizo Plain, which isn't that far away. And and there you can walk on the San Andreas Fault. And you can see the results of where it comes down the hills on the east side, the creeks coming down the streets on the, initially just ran straight down across the plain. But the plain is on the Pacific plate, and it is moving north, northwest. And over the years, it has moved so much that there's a 400-foot jog. It comes down like this, and then it goes like this, 
and then it goes across the plane because of, because of that difference. And when it was it was it's fun to see those things in, in the flesh. Sheila, first of all, I want to remark how well groomed and dressed you are. <laughs> As as always, even when I walk with you in your garden, you're always impeccable. Uh, as was pointed out, the big challenges to our city today are State Street. And, but I'd like to know your thoughts and the best approach for citizens to respond to the hazard project, the so-called builder's remedy that's proposed on Los Olivos next to the mission. What can the citizens do what would you recommend we do? Because we seem to be overridden by state law. And is there any recourse? I, I have been in a state of de serious depression over those two projects, one on Grand Avenue and one right next to the mission of hundreds of apartment units. And just an, both are absolute horrors. And this... The lovely state legislature keeps adopting rules and regulations from local jurisdictions telling us how to do our planning and making all these requirements and demanding uh, cities have to hire more planners just to develop the housing element, for example. Well, in this case, if you didn't, the housing element is for eight years, lays out how what the city is going to be doing about housing. Well, the city doesn't build housing. Uh, the housing authority does, but uh, that's not actually part of the city. And, uh, and, and it's independent, and that's the only kind of housing we really need to tell the truth. It's truly affordable. Um, and I, I have... <laughs> It's not as bad as it seems. Uh, the the project the the project on Grand Avenue is, is submitted their plans. There was a deadline by which they had to submit their plans, and the city said they weren't complete. And they, you know, and they, there's a checklist that. The, developers have and you know you've got to check off all the boxes well not everything was checked off so and and so the city said no the deadline came and now I understand there there are legal <laughs> activities taking place as a result but um i'm i'm not terrified anymore <laughs> of their hap of their happening but it's it's so frustrating, uh, and then it, it, today's independent has an op-ed that I wrote about, and a previous op-ed which said that if Santa Barbara just did this, that, and the other thing, uh, the housing issues would be solved. Well. I recommend <laughs> my op-ed. There's, there's this attitude out there that you know, Santa, Santa Barbara could fix things if it only would. It, it can't. And besides, we've already done by allowing densities in the downtown area along Milpas and at La Cumbre Plaza of up to 63 units to the acre, which is three times what most of the other cities and the county recently increased their density but you know it's still it is unheard of elsewhere in the county and it has resulted in the in the uh, stimulation of construction of apartments but uh, you know their market rate and market rate in santa barbara is way high as anybody i remember an older crowd, I assume most of you have long established residences. Um, but it's, I see more and more uh, articles like in the New York Times about how there's a high housing crisis everywhere across the country. Maybe partly, well, a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, it's not just Santa Barbara. 
and we can't fix it ourselves. We, we are doing more than our share. I might note that while Sheila is loath to take credit for it herself, during her term as mayor, Santa Barbara exceeded its affordable housing goals by 700%. While I admire her book extravagantly, and I'm guessing that many of you have read her book, An Uncommonplace Town, but if you haven't, really go out today and get a copy of it. It's only 101 pages. It's filled with photographs, most of them hers, some of them historic, about Santa Barbara's history. And I've told her I think she's much too modest because You'd never guess from reading her book that she had anything to do with what has happened in Santa Barbara, <laughs> but she has.